Good morning, madam. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for all of uh, all the resource experts. Good morning. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation to be experts for today's uh, distinguished talk. We have three experts. I also welcome all the participants to this uh, particular webinar. Uh, Karnataka, uh, before uh, uh, the actual talks, let me give a brief overview of uh, KSTA. Karnataka Science and Technology Academy is an autonomous organization under the Department of Science and Technology, Government of Karnataka. It was started in the year 2005 under the chairmanship of a renowned space scientist and former chairman of ISRO, Professor U.R. Rao. U.R. Rao chaired the academy for more than 12 years till his uh, sad demise in 2017. After that, another uh, space scientist, Padmashri, Dr. S.K. Shukumar, was our chairman for one and a half years. Now, another uh, great agriculture scientist, former uh, director general of uh, uh, ICR and present chancellor of Central University of uh, Agricultural Sciences, Impal, Dr. S. Ayyappan, sir, is the chairman of KSTA. KSTA organizes many programs across the educational pyramid, right from high school to university level, cater to, catering to the requirement of uh, students studying at various levels. From high school, we organize uh, programs. For high school students, we organize model programs. For uh, PU students, we have uh, one more program like this. For uh, degree students, we have a host of programs. For PG students also, we have many programs. Uh, one of the most important uh, programs of KST is organizing conferences. Till now, KST has organized more than 34 conferences across the state. and. Uh, only nine of them were organized in Bangalore. The rest of 23 were organized in different parts of uh, the state. And uh, we, we have organized in every district of the state. That is uh, our pride. Uh, in the last 15 years, we have covered almost all sectors and all uh, districts of the state. And uh, this year, we have started organizing webinars. This is probably 13th or 14th webinar that we are organizing. Resource experts have been very kind enough. They have accepted our invitation to be with us for the webinars. Similarly, today, uh, all of you have come for uh, delivering the talk. Thank you very much once again. COVID has uh, impact on many sectors, right from education, agriculture, transportation, the communication, etc. Uh, three of you will be delivering talks on uh, Madam Dr. Mira. K will be delivering a talk on communicate uh, related to communication perspective. Uh, Dr. Shuba D. Madam will be delivering a talk on business and medical perspective. And similarly, Madam Bhagya will be delivering a talk on education perspective. I'm sure with your uh, vast experience and knowledge, uh, the participants will be able to uh, assimilate a lot of information from your talks. With this, uh, I once again welcome all of you for this webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Umesh, will take over from me. He will conduct the program. Thank you, sir. Uh, I should also thank our friend, beloved friend, Mr. Vineet, who is responsible for organizing the webinar. I'm very sorry. I should have mentioned it quite early. Uh, anyway, thank you, Mr. Vineet. We, uh, let us associate again for organizing such programs in future as well and also i request madams that we organize the conferences in bangalore and elsewhere wherever it is possible we request you please come and deliver talks thank you thank you sir now before beginning the first session of uh, dr meera k i would like to introduce her uh, dr meera has uh, more than 35 years in the educational field with strong interpersonal skills, master's in history and master in philosophy in education with a law degree. And she has pursued PhD education at present. She is serving as a director in Sheetal, which is a solutions for holistic educational excellence, training and learning. 
uh, with this uh, brief introduction, I would like to welcome Dr. Meera K to deliver a talk on this uh, life after COVID-19. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, can I? Hello, can I see the video? Uh, Umesh? Yes, ma'am. I can't see the video. Uh, how do I see myself? <laughs> yes, come look, ma'am. Uh, the second tool is there. Yeah. Video. Yeah. Start my video. You can click on. Yeah, now uh, you are visible, ma'am. You can start. Uh, I can start? Yes, yes. Okay. Good morning. I thank the KSTA for inviting me to be a speaker on the topic life after COVID. I'm extremely privileged to present my views on this topic. Today, the world is facing an unprecedented global crisis thanks to the COVID-19 virus. Who would have thought that a tiny virus would create such havoc that the entire human race has to rethink the way it existed before. This crisis then is a revelation in a far more literal sense. It is focusing on our collective attention on the many injustices and weaknesses that already exist in how we live together. If people were blind to these faults before, it is hard not to see them now. Man has overcome dreaded infections such as plague, smallpox, polio, and malaria. But this infection has brought us to our knees. Social distancing, face masks, frequent washing of hands, and disinfection of all products has become mandatory, while working from home and online classes have become the new normal. Businesses have been hit, small vendors, migrant labor, eateries, malls, all have taken a beating and the ripple effect is far reaching. This is therefore the time for serious introspection and reflection. Man, with the help of science and technology, has touched great heights, literally and figuratively. The world has become fast paced, techno savvy and materialistic. Power and wealth decided a person's status. But today, COVID-19 has changed all that, as COVID does not differentiate nor discriminate. Communication has taken on a new meaning in these times. The very fact that I'm able to address you all on a virtual webinar is proof of how communication styles have changed. Earlier, social visiting was the norm. Students went to school, and college to get educated, and one went to office and worked. But today, with social distances, there is more dependence on technology such as email, WhatsApp, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Google Dio, FaceTime, Skype, and other such devices. What is now evident is that there is need for using technology to improve our communication and stay in touch with whoever we wish to. As history has shown, choices made during crisis can shape the world for decades to come. The COVID-19 pandemic has been testing the limits of global cooperation. Today, developing countries and developed countries have to work together to overcome the challenge of the pandemic. Choices made now will have far-reaching consequences. Reliance on more of the same is untenable and ignores the scale of human suffering unleashed by the pandemic. The world after the first wave of COVID-19 must become more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable. Communication is a key. How? In the era of social distancing, online communication has gained importance. The mobile today is a magical gadget that is not only ubiquitous, but helps us in multitasking if used in the right manner. At the touch of a button, we can get in touch with our near and dear ones, with our workplace, 
business, bank, store and many other facilities beside helping us with data and entertainment. A word of caution, however, this gadget needs to be used with care and responsibility. Newer versions of the mobile will emerge, but it will also bring the danger of overexposure and overdependence. I know how addicted people are to their mobiles. In fact, the younger generation wonders how we, the older generation, lived without these wonderful gadgets. But at the end of the day, a gadget is only that. It cannot replace relationships, friendship, love, care, concern, compassion, and other human qualities which somehow have taken a back seat. I recall a story where a child wished to be reborn as a smartphone so that her parents would have time for her. This is a very ironic example of how the times have changed, but now the pandemic has made us realize many, many truths. The forced isolation at home these days has in a way brought families closer and we need to cherish nurture and strengthen these fragile bonds even when the pandemic is behind us. The pandemic crisis has accelerated the pace of digital transformation with further expansion in e-commerce and increases in the pace of adoption of telemedicine, video conference, online teaching, etc. Yet, in some ways, we have begun practicing age-old techniques of yoga, greeting, cooking and hygiene and this has been endorsed by experts in the medical field we need to install instill courage grit and determination and above all patience because when this virus will be eradicated we do not know and how it will be eradicated is again a moot point our scientists and researchers are working on discovering a vaccine but it will take time our hospitals Doctors, nurses and paramedical staff, besides our police and security, have all been overburdened, yet they carry on doing their duty selflessly. Let us appreciate and salute these COVID warriors. On the other hand, we have tales of selfishness, callousness and negligence. But we need to educate and empower the general public rather than create a fear psychosis. Our social media, especially today, needs to communicate the right information and be a little more responsible. The world after COVID-19 is unlikely to return to the world that was. Life after the pandemic will go on, but I think humanity has learned some lessons from this dark period. It is said that those who do not learn from the mistakes of history are bound to repeat them. Let us stop destroying the environment for our selfish ends. Let us learn to live in peace and amity. Let us harness the wonderful and awesome power of science and technology for the benefit of mankind and not its destruction. In a short story called The Machine Stops by E.M. Foster, written way back in 1947, he envisaged a world in which most of the human population had lost the ability to live on the surface of the earth and is forced to live underground in isolation cells with all body, bodily and other needs met by the omnipotent global machine. But one day the machine stops, leaving behind total chaos and destruction. The strong message here, which E.M. Foster tried to tell us, is that if we become too dependent on technology, we will lose our humanity. This is not to say that we have to do away with technology, but the fate of the human race depends on the technologies we develop. Let us not throw the baby out with the bathwater, but learn to use technology to better our lives. Let us not become like the child who, when told by his mother that he needs some fresh air and exercise, asks her to send the link. This is an example of how our future generations has become so addicted to the internet, to the iPad, to the mobile. Therefore, let us not let machines rule our lives. Let us re revert to our eternal values and learn to live a simple, healthy and harmonious life 
rather than crave for the superficial, artificial, and the synthetic. Let us live in communion with nature rather than in conflict. The most important lesson from the COVID-19 pandemic is the importance of working together on problems that affect the entire human race. We are much stronger united than divided. The world will then be a far, far better place than you, it used to be. Before I conclude, I have a small video which aptly summarizes all that I have said. Please do watch this video. Thank you. Umesh? Yes, ma'am. Running. The video, please. Can you hear the volume? Yeah, raise it. I can't hear it. If you all can hear it, it's fine with me. Thank you. Stop it, uh, Umesh. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, to feel much better, we have to first get sick. That's the message we have taken from this video. 
Thank, Thank you, very you much. so much. Yes. Uh, uh, there are no questions, ma'am. We will take uh, at the end of the okay, session. Okay, sure, sure, sure. With the running short of time, we will continue to yes. the next session. Okay. Uh, now, I would like to introduce Dr. Shubha, ma'am. Mm. Uh, who, uh, who has graduated from Andhra Medical College, moved to UK. Mm. Moved to UK and uh, where she trained and practiced as general practitioner for over 10 years. And she undertook a postgraduate diploma in clinical dermatology from the University of Cardiff. Dr. Shuba also trained in hair transplantation techniques in Poland under Dr. Mavan Saifi and under several eminent aesthetic surgeons across UK. Whilst in the UK, she successfully established two clinics. She came back to India and she started Lejeune group of MedFast, which she presently runs in Bangalore and Hyderabad, Alali. And also she consults at various multi-speciality hospitals across India. With this brief introduction, I would like to welcome Dr. Shubha ma'am to deliver a talk on health and business perspective in the life after uh, uh, this pandemic COVID-19. Uh, please welcome ma'am, uh, over to you ma'am, thank you. Um, hi, uh, thank you, Mesh. I hope I'm audible. Yes, ma'am, audible. And... Thank you for the introduction, Umesh. Uh, thank you, KSTA, for giving me this platform and uh, to be inviting me as a panelist to talk about the medical and business perspective of life after COVID. It's an interesting topic. And well, don't we all want to know what lies ahead? Um, Dr. Meera, your presentation was absolutely wonderful. I completely agree with you on the communication perspective. The fact that we are on this platform right now on a WebEx and speaking about it just proves, just goes to show how much the world has changed. And um, and you have also given us a peek into um, you know what can happen if we depend or over depend on technology. Um, that's that's uh, that's something that we must be aware of. Today, I'm not going to concentrate on the negative aspects, though. Um, I'm going to focus on what lies ahead and uh, what positive changes we will see in life after COVID. Um, in the face of adversity, there are two choices that we have. We can either be bitter or we can be better. Which one do you choose to be? Next, please. Yes, ma'am. The first and foremost obstacle is that we need to identify what lies in the room. There is a big elephant in the room and we need to acknowledge that. We need to acknowledge it, we maybe even name it. Uh, we need to recognize that there is a problem. Only then we can have positive communication. Do you all know what elephant I'm talking about right now? That is, yes, it is a change. It's a big, it's a big thing right now after COVID. There is going to be a big change and also fear. And uh, the world, as we know, has changed. It has changed in many, many ways and is continues, continuing to change. And this is something that we need to get on top of. The atmosphere today is, is of uncertainty. It's negativity, a lot of fear. There's unsustainable practices, redundancy, loss of faith, negativity, and hopelessness. We can't see light at the end of the tunnel. We don't know what lies ahead and if this situation is going to repeat itself in future. Next, please. For sure, we see a lot of changes, both positive and negative that COVID has brought with it. This is the best example. And it is a wake up call for us to brace ourselves and to prepare for the future. As a human race, I really, feel that we have not reached our highest potential and therefore this cannot be the end. We will continue to adapt, evolve and emerge stronger than ever before. Next please. From a medical perspective, I see that people will take a lot more interest in health. They will get more health conscious they will certainly listen to their doctors and take medical advice, but more importantly, the COVID generation has will bring with it preventive medicine. People will be looking at preventive medicine. 
they will not want to live with comorbidities. They will want to actively do something about it and also take care of their health. Next, please. I also see that people will strive to be more fit than ever before. If we have learned one thing from this, COVID has targeted the unfit people and people with ill health and comorbidities. So I think fitness related events, sports events, marathons, um, bodybuilding, bodyweight exercises, yoga, HIIT, weightlifting, all the cardiovascular activity, the cardio, this is all going to um, be sought after by people. And this is going to keep our cardiovascular system conditioned and also will build immunity. Next, please. For the same reason, we will also see people investing more of their time with the wellness programs. Wellness retreats, wellness centers will flourish. Um, wellness is all about preventive medicine. It is about taking care of ourselves even before we get sick. So people will be more interested in preventive than in cure. So we will also see a lot of wellness gurus that will suddenly see a spike in followers. Next, please. Uh, we uh, mo more people are realizing the temporariness of life, and hence, a lot more people will take up, I think, to spirituality and uh, meditation. More sustainable practices, conscious living are the things that people will um, will look at and will seek satisfaction and happiness within within what they have. Next, please. Yoga is our gift to the world. During COVID times, we have realized what a gem of an exercise yoga is. It's been created in, the, in our ancient traditional life sciences, yet we have not fully explored it. The West has completely utilized it, but we haven't. The gift of controlling one's own body and mind is great. And with yoga, you can perform this in the most confined spaces at home with no equipment at all. More people have been forced to work out from homes during the COVID times and have taken up yoga practices and will continue to do so in future. Next, please. We will also be more conscious with our food habits. Home cooked food has served us really well during this time. And I believe that people will look to get fitter and healthier and will look to um, lose weight and deal with obesity issues and hence will look at dietary changes and lifestyle modifications. Um, they will look at both sustainable as well as unsustainable dietary practices. But I think what will come up trumps in all of this is probably plant based diet. Plant-based diet, plant-based uh, food has is has a lot of evidence and will um, and and will uh, teach us more about strength and immunity building than any other type of diet. Next, please. Vitamins, supplements, Ayurveda, homeopathy, and alternate medicine will also find space in our shelves. <laughs> People today are more aware of immunity and COVID has taught us uh, and also made us aware of our own vitamin D deficiencies and vitamin C requirements today. Next, please. This is self-explanatory. In times of adversities, we, the family, stick together. So I think family time is very valuable and will be given much more value than before. Um, the relationships will be considered more precious and they will only get stronger. Next, please. Well, who doesn't want to spend time outside? We can't wait for COVID uh, to end so that we can all go out and get some nice sunlight and uh, also indulge in outdoor activities. So outdoor activities will flourish. People will seek them. They will want to go on picnics and have barbecues outside they want to go biking hiking and we will make up with all the the travel the holidays and everything else that we have missed next 
Hygiene and safety is something that COVID has taught us. It has taught us sanitization measures, masking measures, social distancing, hand washing, and this is something that we will not forget. Um, today, a fruit vendor probably knows more about sanitation and uh, and you know and uh, scrubbing up more than anybody else, and he's probably doing almost the same as an OT nurse or or, or, or an OT doctor. So this is something that we will not forget. Next, please. Uh, life after COVID will also force more and more business to look at more sustainable practices, to look at more eco-friendly um, practices. We need to thank our environment, like Dr. McMira has said, and we need to respect it. We need to be earth friendly, and this will be a great welcome change. What we have not been able to achieve for years together will now um, dawn upon people's minds quicker. There are a lot more changes that are seen in our work environment. Business and economy has taken a very uh, big impact, but yet we are seeing so much major changes in this environment in such a short time. I think we need to relook at our career, our goals, our jobs, and, and th this is much needed at this point of time to reorient ourselves. Next, please. Uh, the human, the friendly human interface will change to a uh, more machine interface. A lot of companies and employers will be looking at having a machine interface. We're already seeing this in airports where we go to book ourselves in. Um, and uh, this will also be seen in uh, medical clinics as well. So this is something that we will see more in the future. Next, please. The processes will also be more automated now than ever. Artificial intelligence, automated systems, robotics are all systems that we will all have to get familiar with. Today, airport booking, security, shopping, billing are all such. No internet went Yes, yes. Yes, we can hear him. Due to low next bandwidth, slide. video is not. Uh, very... Can I it see the next hard. slide? slide? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Ah, okay. Probably network connections. Okay. Right. Yes, yes. So digitization boom started well before uh, many, many years before the Corona crisis, but now it is going to snowball into something else. Everybody that we know will be looking to digitize everything, products and services and even experiences. Next, please. The key engagement platforms that will now evolve will, of course, be videos and apps and social media. These will emerge stronger than ever before. People will have access to so much more content at their fingertips and they will be easily diverted. So companies and uh, companies need to really look at engaging them by coming up with creative content. Next, please. The brands that have never looked at online presence are now being forced to look at being online. Offline to online is the way to go. And uh, we have e-commerce platforms to grocery shopping to online courses. People are seeking um, these things online and they're getting more and more tech savvy. Housewives, as well as you know, the older generation, people know how to order today from a big basket or from Licious. Next, please. Employee, employers, as well as companies, are going to be ruthless at cutting jobs. There will be a lot of redundancy, and uh, what this will do is that we only the real talent and real professionals will be able to sustain in this environment. People will need to pick up skills. They'll need to acquire new uh, skills, be hardworking and have discipline to be able to 
survive this environment. Next, please. We have been working really well from home. A lot of companies realize that as well as the employers and employees. We can be equally productive working from home. Many self-employed people as well have set up home offices. I think the decrease in the commute time has probably given us more time to spend with work and will ensure more productivity. So I really see that commercial office rentals will plummet um, and more and more will, people will take up home offices. Next, please. Home-based businesses uh, such as arts and crafts, uh, home kitchens and other home-based businesses uh, such as making chocolates and sauces and pickles from home will also flourish. A lot of the stay-at-home uh, wives and moms and redundant people have taken up home-based businesses, and this is something that they will continue to grow. Next, please. People have also realized and reassessed their career goals and want to look at now what really interests them and will rework on their hobbies and priorities. They are clear now more than ever that they would like to pursue their passion. Next, please. Have you heard of the Choluteca Bridge? This, I want to tell you about this story. This is a bridge in uh, Honduras in Central America that has been built in a region which faced a lot of which, uh, forces of the nature like hurricane and heavy storms. It was a strong bridge that was built by the Japanese. Um, it was a beautiful, magnificent bridge, and it was became soon became the pride of the city. But in the same year that it was built, the area received a lot of uh, rainfall. Hurricane Mitch hit the city and devastated the city. Seven thousand people lost their lives. All the bridges in the region broke and were damaged completely. Um, the river flooded, and uh, there was about seventy five inches of rain probably the amount of rain that the, re the region would have received in about six months of time. Choluteca Bridge stood um, star strong, but what happened was that the entry to the bridge and then the exit roads were both swept away. The river also changed course. It, it, it formed a new channel through which it started running, and now the river was running beside the bridge and not under the bridge. Next, please. This bridge actually tells us that change is inevitable and we need to adapt to change. If we don't adapt, we will be like the Choluteca Bridge, a bridge that goes to nowhere. Next, please. So our mantra for the post-COVID era is simple. Change is really inevitable and we need to adapt to change. If we don't, we stagnate and we go nowhere. There are two wolves within us. There is the fear wolf that is always um, reminding us about negativity and uncertainty and fear. Whereas the um, other, the faith wolf, gives us positivity and uh, hopefulness. So which wolf do you think will win? It will be the wolf that you feed. So make sure that you feed the right wolf. We all realize the importance of life, hence we must work with a purpose and work to find real satisfaction and happiness, but we must also live our life to the fullest with absolutely no regrets, because at the end, happiness Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, Thank you. That, uh, uh, most informative presentation. And indeed, it's a very great uh, presentation from your end. Uh, we'll uh, take a Q&A session at the end of uh, Dr. Bhagya, ma'am's session. Uh, now, uh, 
i would like to request uh, dr bagya ma'am uh, to take the uh, session before that i would like to introduce her dr bagya ma'am has 18 years in the educational field and being a prolific author she has just submitted her thesis and she is she has extensive experience as a teacher and in the administration of institutes now with this brief introduction i request once again miss bagya ma'am to deliver a session on education's perspective life after covid 19 life after covid 19 thank you ma'am oh, what to you what to you yeah thank you sir a oh, very good morning to everybody it, at the outset i would like to thank karnataka science academy department of science government of karnataka for organizing a webinar session on life after covid the topic of my presentation is going to be uh, sir can you please this is like the topic of my presentation is going to be from the education next slide i would like to start my presentation with a quote by joseph edison who says that what sculpture to a block of marble education is to a next slide as i move forward the quality guru edward jailing rightly says the world's great development will happen only when human development does happen in the economy so human development is very essential for sustainable growth education system what we have at present more on academic examination oriented and little towards the employment and uh, the concept of education is all about uh, developing the individual physically mentally emotionally and spiritually when the research, the research study says that the reason for educating is going to be that the human development index has to be built uh, the education today has taken a paradigm shift and we look forward for the vision there in case of the higher education next slide higher education is that the new education policy what come out right now speaks about three five block institutions the first type of institution is going to be a foundation institution which is going to develop the hardcore conceptual learning of the curriculum and the second type of institution is all about the career focused institutions which are going to look into the professional courses which are going to be taught to the students at the higher education level and the third one is going to be inclined towards the research focused institution this is a very limited uh, in uh, education institution to the research focused institution but maybe a few year a few decades later all the institutions will have to transform themselves into a research focused institution the next slide the statement of indian higher education says that Build up a 21st century model for higher education. What we need to look into is to enhance the gross enrollment ratio and to cater to the which is going to be offered at a affordable price, where the holistic learning should be. The holistic learning can happen only when the education is going to become the perspective. Next slide, sir. these are the type of the institutions institutes which have been devised by the new education policy that is the foundation institution the career focus and the research focus the institutions which are at the infant stage will be at the foundation level slowly move on to the career focus institutes and at the end maybe in a decade or so they will have to convert themselves into focused on research and development the covid pandemic has radiated its shadow on the academic sphere in the educational institutions not only in india but across the world so online education is not is become a new novel today for education across the country and there is a requirement of the robust connectivity undoubtedly which is critical for the success of learning the usage of e learning in the time of corona is the most talked topic across the globe which has been a crisis as of today well may, you can see that many educators are calling for the concept of blended learning and the hybrid learning where technology plays a very very important role uh, it goes without saying that the uh, global pandemic has reshaped the centuries old chalk dartboard and chalk and the blackboard uh, based uh, model 
uh, which has been replaced by methodology, that is the technology which has led to use of advanced As according to NASCOM, which rightly says, every year 3 billion graduates and postgraduates are added to the Indian workforce, where only 25% of the technical graduates and 10 to 50% of the other graduates are considered eligible. Have been hearing, have been hearing from the various educationists saying that the skills have to be emphasized, the skills have to be converted into a competency which can really prepare, and this pandemic has led in the positive light of upscaling the skills is required for the future. We had this online course was happening way back a few years before, but now today has become an hour where online learning has become a hour of requirement. It's a requirement of today. Uh, the FICC covered survey of 2018 says that India is facing a severe shortage of skilled manpower, especially in case of the undergraduates, because we are not preparing them for this global competitive the time has come today where we are able to virtually connect ourselves to the global world and make this a better, uh, having a better competitive edge where the world is going to be called the global village. Now with the advent of the pandemic globally, the traditional campuses of the physical infrastructure support has been replaced by the private spaces allowing extensive use of technology, the internet and the social media has led to the reduction in the teacher-student face-to-face interaction. Very limited discussion has been happening with student-centric individual learning and development has been happening through the customized tools and the content which has been addressed to various needs of the, it is something like a tailor-made requirement for the students. Uh, the concept of uh, physical evaluation has been uh, replaced in the education system with the blended methods which is leading to the formative assessments and evaluation where the learning outcomes becomes very advanced in the present and the next stage of online courses. Now there is a lot of learning flexibility. The course modules are made according to the need of the R and these courses have the ability of having number of options where the materials are going to be made available online. And uh, the preference of today's industry, as we can see, is that the labor forces which are driving towards the virtual education, that has become the order of the day. So can I have the next slide, sir? Just stepping up, just moving one step back, if you can go back to the curricular system, during that time, 64 different types of skills, interdisciplinary were taught, and today you can still see that multiple new skills have been added because you have to match yourself to the corporate world or the dynamic environment where we are going to be getting the competition from various dimensions. Right, sir? Moving forward, the industry today requires a person who is ready. Can I have the next slide, sir? Industry today wants an uh, instant package which they are going to be handpicking from the environment where the individuals have the potential. The industry says that we are not here to teach you everything. You have to come a ready-made instant package for me to start working on the shop floor. And how do we equip that? Education with skills, developing the competence is a solution for these uh, expectations what we have from the industry. And the industry wants the educationist or the education sector to deliver the ready-made employees where they're going to be making them as the workforce in their company. The next, moving forward, there are three types, next slide, sir. There are three types of schools which makes it a complete education as such, whether it is pandemic, pandemic or it can be post pandemic. It is a concept of aligning, balancing and connecting. When it comes to aligning, we call it as the alphabet school where it's just the content learning what really happens. The second movement, progressive, which is going to be B school, which 
which trains the individual to prepare themselves to the corporate world, to the business world, which where uh, the educations have to convert them into human capital. And the third is going to be converting the junior to the concept of conscious learning with creativity and innovation. Next slide, sir. This is an effort made into uh, creating a model which is applicable for the next post-pandemic period. You need to look into this student-centric learning and it has to be for the later life success what education can contribute to them. I've just taken up five aspects of higher education architecture which can be a foundation for effective governance. The first is the curriculum, the second is the faculty, the research, partnership and infrastructure. Next slide, sir. Now, the present day is a day of e-learning and there is a requirement that there is need for internationalization of the curriculum and there is a requirement of the revamp of the present curriculum which is already happening and the articulation is going to be happening through online education it's a virtual classroom it's virtual uh, sessions that happen and every house every individual has become a become a study institute which has been connected through technology and this will help in order to develop the skills where we can equip the present generation to match up with the dynamic changes that happen. Any number of pandemic that comes up, we are ready to face the challenge such. Moving forward, now uh, education is for economic the next slide, sir. Education is for the economic development a human capital converted to materialize to contribute to the society. That can happen only through the concept of skills. Multiple skills required in the present day as our Prime Minister was articulating a few years and which is, which is uh, uh, very much relevant today, that is the skill of being an entrepreneur. Today you can see because of the pandemic we can see lots of people are looking into starting up their own small startups or enter being more enterprising which can fetch them some revenue which requires the skill. So we had a talk about Skill India, the actual implementation of Skill India is happening now. Now, the first aspect, next slide sir, the first aspect is connected to curriculum. Now the curriculum is made in such a way that the virtual impact through experiential learning is the order of the day and the learning style present is going to be listening to the pre-recorded lectures which make them more competent to understand the practical, uh, understand the conceptual and try implementing through the experiential learning. And uh, to develop the future leaders, the skills are supposed to be envisaged to them. It can help, in, help them to become entrepreneurs and the concept of self-learning makes them more, uh, much more equipped to face the world later. The second aspect, next, next slide, sir. The second component is about the faculty. Indian faculties are now, who are already tech savvy, are getting themselves affiliated to universities, moving from the traditional university to the new universities, where they are going to be conducting the online classes, and the faculties have become. Um, more conscious about using new models of teaching using the technology which is supposed to be student-centric teaching. And the next one is going to be about they are trying to invest their time and efforts more on research and a little more efforts regarding the skills which are required in online teaching. And they also look into about research collaboration which is, the, which is replaced by research competition. I hope most of us have been in the last four months have been listening to multiple lectures, multiple sessions. We have the joy of learning something. So it has become a, more than a research collaboration becomes a research competition, equipping ourselves to know something better. If I cannot upskill myself, this, uh, if I cannot upskill myself during this pandemic, I'll never be able to upskill myself later on to prepare myself to see future challenges what I need. Next slide, sir. 
Now, coming to the concept of research, which has become quintessential, is unless we create a culture of research within ourselves and, and pass it on to our students and in the uh, academic field, it is not going to be worthwhile. A good teacher is going to be the one who gets themselves equipped with the research culture with the help of having the mentors and creating a research center or a research cell at the institution where they do work and the research to be more not on. I don't say it should not be more of uh, subject oriented research but I still feel that if at all the research is going to be community development research it can be contributing to the economy. The next slide, and moving towards the partnership. That is, we need to partner and we need to collaborate with various other industries and the organizations to see that they do get, the students do get the feel of internship because now internship is happening virtually, online, and also placement interviews are also happening online where work from home, become, work from home has become the order of the day. Let's move forward to the next slide. The concept of infrastructure, the strategic expansion is happening today. The infra physical infrastructure is a criteria as such. And uh, they also led the forest there. There might be a day, there will be a day in a few years at least. I do a course, one from my Bangalore, one from my Madhabad, one from Christ Institution, Christ Autonomous Institution. So there will be a phase wherein, or it could be a foreign collaborator institution where we are going to be lined up. And this learning will happen, not in the physical space, but with the virtual class. So the infrastructure expenditures to the organizations, that is, the companies and the in companies, industries, and the institutions going to be done. The next one is coming to about the concept of funding. Which is very essential. The government has been into the various methods of funding. There, uh, only the awareness is required. There are many companies are coming forward for corporate funding for the organization, for the um, for the education education who are going to be sending the potential individuals to work in the organization. And one more concept of funding which comes before we become eliminated funding. Just to quote an example, alumina, uh, the alumina is of uh, Aloysius donated floors together. That is where they're able to be, they're able to be getting their basic goodwill and able to get the best, the best and the best of the facilities. The last component what I would be touching is about the concept of governance, which is very important. Simplifying the rules and regulations, mandatory accreditation, because. It makes us to equip, it makes us to develop ourselves and to lay a benchmark with all the other elite institutions across the globe. And there is a requirement of conducting an academic audit, see whether it's proper. And lastly, the last slide please, the productivity or oh, the productivity, productivity is associated to the output what we are going to be getting with the inputs what we are going to be contributing and the pandemic has led to upscaling the skills and the competences required to face the challenge ahead. The need for the business to earn the profit and the need for the everyone to skills where we are going to be having a uh, sustained development in the economy and thank you very much so that's my last slide thank you very much thank you everybody and thank you for the organizing team for giving me an opportunity to share my regarding post pandemic thank you very much ma'am thank you very much ma'am now uh, we have uh, some questions, we have questions. The first one, uh, this is for Do you think people will save the planet? Especially the government. Dr. Meera, ma'am. Yes. What is it? 
Uh, do you think people will save the planet, especially by the government? I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Do you think the planet will be saved by the common people and what action should be taken by the common man and especially by the government? I think the uh, key is the common man himself because uh, unless the common man decides, nothing really changes in the world. All revolutions have been wrought by the common man. So governments have to pay heed to the issues and the problems faced by the common man. Today we have seen what can happen when the common man does not listen. So I think the governments have to pay heed to what the common man needs and what the common man requires in terms of safety measures, in terms of communication, in terms of uh, uh, education, in terms of business, all this. Uh, today, uh, we cannot ignore because all over the world, it is not the rich or the haves who are going to decide, but it's the man on the street. Thank you, madam. Now, the next question is, uh, as usual, India has been unreliable. When do we realize that our system will be vulnerable? For uh, the question is to me. Yes, Hello. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Is the question addressed to me? Yes, ma'am. I'll repeat it once again. Yeah. India has been unreliable. When do we realize that our system will be vulnerable? In terms of I wouldn't. Okay. I wouldn't uh, pass a very sweeping statement saying India has been unreliable. I think. Uh, it is very easy for us to pass remarks, sweeping remarks, and uh, pass a judgment. I'm sure the government is also grappling with its own uh, uh, pressures and its own uh, concerns. But yes, we do have a lot of loopholes, and uh, we, the government needs to be a little more, uh, uh, I think, uh, more concerned, more responsible, and. Uh, I don't know whether this lockdown uh, which we had in phases really helped us or has it uh, uh, in a way when we compare ourselves to the rest of the world, we are told that yes, we are in a better status, but I'm not too sure about it. I think we need to, uh, the government seriously needs to uh, do a rethink on its policies, whether economically, or um, otherwise. So I think the government uh, has the right intentions, I believe. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I believe. And I think we need to have that faith if we want things to change. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Now this question will be done to Dr. Shubha, ma'am. The question is, uh, how the government should prioritize universal health care? Okay. Um, well, uh, universal health care, um, are you talking about private institutions or are you talking about government uh, hospitals? You can uh, tell me about both, ma'am. You can uh, answer about both. Okay. Government as well as private. I, I really think that we have the best system in India. We have the best of both. We have the government uh, uh, health care, uh, which, uh, you know, which will be useful to a lot of people. Um, and we also have private. I've, I have worked in, um, having worked at NHS, and I have seen how people struggle to, um, to get anything done, a huge waiting lists in the NHS. I think uh, it is also going towards privatization, and we are lucky enough that we can take that pressure away uh, from the government hospitals. We have the best of both worlds, and I do see a lot of um, uh, alternate uh, medicine also flourishing in India. Homeopathy, Ayurveda are something that um, is going to um, flourish in India as well. 
So for for maybe for certain ailments that modern medicine has no solution to, there will always be that Ayurveda or homeopathy that people will turn towards. And I really see, like I was saying, it is going to be more about prevention than cure. People are going to be more fit and healthy. They're going to um, they're going to believe in wellness so much more. Happiness, wellness, overall health, fitness, diet, lifestyle modifications, all of this. And government can help with, again, incentivizing uh, people to be more fit and healthy. That's uh, That's what I think. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think this is a general question. Uh, all three of you can answer on this. Since there are no vacations, as of now, it's an era of and work from home. And uh, all uh, people, parents, kids will be in home, working, as well as learning uh, related to education, take it school, e-learning system, and uh, working employees. Uh, what will be the stress level to the uh, persons working from home and uh, what will be the education system for schools and uh, communication also you all three can question one by one first uh, i would like to open this forum to dr shubha ma'am i um, i can relate to this because i have a young i uh, have a 5 year old uh, with his online education and then with my full time job our careers you know we're self employed i have my clinic we finding it extremely difficult with struggling. So I have to wake up so early in the morning. If I have to prioritize myself, my health, my fitness, um, my priorities and taking care of my child, um, I and my husband take turns with his education. I'm sure a lot of parents are struggling out there. I really don't know what the solution is. I it's It's going to be probably a little bit more easier for stay at home moms uh, for housewives but it's going to be very difficult for the working population thank you very much ma'am now over to you ma'am dr meera ma'am uh, i would say that uh, we have to now make a paradigm shift in our lives and uh, get used to the idea of online education online work <laughs> online <laughs> everything <laughs> i i know that uh, like dr shubha says she has a clinic there are people who will have to go out and work but somehow i think we will need to adapt ourselves to the new uh, normal that's all i can say because i i have a granddaughter who's 14 years old and she has to get up and be ready for class by eight o'clock in the morning and then she comes down for breakfast only by 11 and then lunch is around two o'clock so the entire system revolves around her classes it's 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 quite uh, different when they used to go to school you know that they're in school till a certain time but now it's all flexi timings sometimes they have a debate at 3 30 in the afternoon which goes on till 4 30 so you uh, we I, and those who are working from home also my daughter is an advocate and she has to listen to cases online so you can imagine how uh, the work has you know changed she does go to court once in a while but more and less more or less now everything has become online so i think all of us uh, and me especially i'm i'm in the you know oldest generation amongst the three of the speakers i think for me it's it's totally different because i am above the age of 60 i have not moved out of the house since march and whatever i'm doing i'm doing online i take online classes and it has been difficult for me because i like meeting people but uh, you know, with my age and uh, having a condition where I'm uh, diabetes, uh, you know, positive, so I cannot move out. I cannot mingle. And so I have to adjust to the situation. I think we all have to. And that is what we all have to live with. That's why I said patience, grit, determination. These three are very, very important in these times. And like Dr. Shubha said, we have to be positive and take it as a welcome change in a way which is going to change our view of the entire world 
maybe that's what uh, the divine has pre is preparing us for that's what i believe thank you ma'am now over to bagya ma'am <laughs> that our uh, lifestyle will enhance because we didn't have much of work to do and we spent a lot of time with the family. We got quality time. But as the concept of work from home came up, I can hear from my friends who are working in the companies where they're working for 10 hours or 12 hours or land work for 14 hours at a time. The whole systems from the companies have moved to their home. The companies have taken the effort to see that all the uh, required things are provided at their home. So now things have changed and many of them want to move because of the company to have something on their own. But nevertheless, it, uh, I can see that when it comes to health sector, there has been a lot of shift, change that's happened. It is for the positive. The eating habits have changed. People prefer to eat prepared, which is prepared at home. Earlier it was the concept of eating outside. So health-wise has changed when it comes to the nature, things have changed. When it comes to education, we were thinking of it, uh, but the pace has moved. We have two X ahead. That is because of the online classes, what we have today, we have many of them have got registered in such as Fiam and multiple other courses, what they're doing. The internet has enhanced, and this is going to be the order of the day. If we don't scale up ourselves, if we don't equip ourselves today, we become outdated. So pandemic, it has a positive impact on the education sector and uh, on the health sector, on the health too. But uh, there are other side effects. So the screen time has enhanced for all of us. So which is going to be having an impact for us and the later generations. But let us take, as Madam was saying, Mira Ma'am was saying, and Shubha Ma'am was saying, let us take things in the positive note. Let us move positively because we cannot close our eyes to change. What is constant in life is change. So we have to adapt ourselves. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Now, now, one more last question to Dr. Shubha. Will the appointments become redundant for the patients? The patients. of changing with this appointment system. There are a lot of software, medical software, where you can book your appointments like Practo, for example. The many, many, many softwares that are coming up, it will be easier online bookings. I think there'll be video consultations, teleconsultations will be more commonplace. Um, until we know, you know, what's happening with this virus, the doctors are not, they're, they're going to be more careful contact and social distancing, all of this is going to be followed. The clinics are following a lot of protocols, sanitizing, checking the temperatures, the PPE suits, all of that. Um, so we don't know how long this is going to go on until, but by then we would have established systems in clinics. It will be automated. It will be teleconsultation for sure. Um, yeah, really, it's only the people who really need to necessarily uh, go to a clinic and be examined will be the ones that will be invited to the clinics. Thank you, Thank you ma'am. Now, before concluding, uh, I request our CEO, Dr. M. Ramesh, sir, to have few words. Good afternoon, madams. I listen to all of your talk. Really super excellent. I would like to thank all of you immensely on behalf of KFPA. All, all, the, all three of you gave positives of COVID, post-COVID. Till now, we have been hearing only negatives, as the world will come to an end in a few days. I, I would like to thank you immensely for giving all positives. Recently, we have brought out a strategy paper on COVID from KSTA. It's available on our website. And Madam rightly said that patience, grit, and determination are mainly required to go forward. Thank you very much. Kind of you. Now I would like to express my gratitude to all the speakers, uh, uh, Dr. Shubha ma'am, Dr. Meera Kesh Ittal ma'am, and Dr. Bhagya ma'am uh, for delivering their uh, uh, presentation on uh, life after COVID-19 with their voluminous experience and uh, 
uh, great presentations uh, on behalf of uh, KSTA and uh, E-Vidya. Uh, I would like to thank all the madams. Uh, we'll in future we'll collaborate for uh, such uh, 30 minutes uh, capsule videos and webinars. Uh, uh, we can call you on that time also, ma'am. Uh, uh, thank you very much on behalf of once again Department of Science and Technology and Government of Karnataka. Thank you once again.